What's up, y'all? Will Lucas here, Black Tech Green Money, here for another episode. I'm so excited about this one. It's my second time talking to Isaac Hayes. Isaac Hayes III is the founder of Fanbase app, which I believe is like the biggest social media app owned by a black person like ever. And currently he's in the middle of a $17 million fundraising effort, which you can participate in. If you got a couple hundred dollars, you can get in. Enjoy this conversation. So I'm interested in how you guys have um, been intentional about making sure creators get paid. You know, there's so many other platforms that you've got to build massive followings before you even qualify to get paid. So talk about your philosophy on that and why it was important for you to do it and how it works for creators to get money on day one. Well, I mean, it's the DNA of fan base. And, and what I mean by that is um, from from the inception of the company, I wanted to build something where People could have followers for free, but also monetize through subscription or tipping. Um, and so it's kind of like the the combination of what, I guess, two different genres of social media are, which are like fan communities and then social networks. And I wanted to put those two together um, in a place that I think would bring more people together. And so um, that's how we that's how we built platforms, you know, to do that. And it's so hard for creators to either monetize on these platforms because advertising is involved so that suppresses your content or you might be someone that never even knew that you had the knack for content creation and so it's kind of like you can graduate from just a social media user to a content creator while being on fan base and you won't have to leave and go start directing people to the place where you want to monetize it's already there for you it's already you know set up for you to be able to do so so that's that's one of the important things that that I think separates us from everybody else. You, you've got a, a big platform for creative ownership and you talk about that regarding music and social media. And I'm interested in your thoughts on how you imagine your advocacy and evangelism of ownership might impact how people deal with other social media apps. I mean, especially for the black community, it it's just such a, it's such a huge gap between like what people, it's this huge gap between what people make and, and, and contribute to the platform and then the actual ownership of the platform. Like, like Instagram and Facebook, these are hundred plus billion dollar companies. And I think that, you know, uh, for, for, for people that look like us and advocating an ownership of the actual infrastructure as opposed to just being customers to the creations that we have. So like we make the platforms cool, but then on the back end, who owns the actual, you know, the stock, who owns the equity. And so this is a really good opportunity for people to have equity in something moving forward as social media apps evolve, that there'll be other apps to come along, even other apps after, between, during fan base. But this one's going to be unique because ownership is part of the, the construct of the company and how people are going to be able to, to actually see a return on an exit or an IPO as well as make money on the front end and being, you know, business owner. So I think that's important. It's, it's so interesting. You talk about equity. I was, I was watching your live stream with, um, with Jermaine Dupree and I had this conversation years ago with B Cox on Brian Michael Cox on equity. And when you mention stuff like that, many, particularly, unfortunately, black creators don't understand what equity is. They want to see cash today. And so you've got like this dual challenge of number one, explaining that why equity is important and getting people to use the app. So getting people to use the app is a challenge in and of itself, but now you've got to explain why, why it's important economically. So can you talk about like, what do you, what do you hear Isaac when you hear people say, you know, equity, like, I don't know what that is, you know, give me the bag. And like, that's gotta like make you feel a way. Well, like, so I think it's a learning curve, but also I understand that when you're building businesses and especially maybe like the managers or people that represent these artists or these personalities themselves, like 99% of businesses fail. Like, you know, so saying you're gonna give somebody an equity, it's not gonna mean anything if the business fails. The uniqueness about um, equity and ownership in social media is the very thing that gives social media its value is the ability for people to move people where you want them to go, mm -hmm. increase users and grow the platform. So for something like fan base, you're in control of your own success. You're in the driver's seat. If you bring a million people to fan base, 
fan base's value goes from what it is today, which is $160 million, to it could be $500 million. It could be $800 million. And we could continue to do that and even bring in more people and offer equity. So the understanding of equity in our community is just a lack of financial literacy that we've always had. And so we know cash. We know what that does. We know, you know, what kind of opportunity it provides. It's an immediate um, uh, 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 influx of, of, of capital that you can decide what you want to do with uh, in a leisurely way or a mm-hmm. responsible way in investing. So I understand why cash is important to young people because, you know, it, it's a very it's a very materialistic society nowadays. I mean, a lot of things that people are into, um, cars and clothes and, you know what I'm saying, lifestyle is a big part of that. But um, when you're thinking about what, what life is going to be for yourself five, 10, 15 years from now, you gotta start thinking about that because all of this can change um, in an instant, but having ownership of something that will continue to grow is is something that I think more people need to learn about. And I thought that was striking that a lot of the white creators have equity, have been offered equity in these companies and a lot of black creators have been offered cash and not mm. equity. And that's a big, that's a big thing. Like, okay, like, like academics doesn't have equity in Rumble Kai Sinat doesn't have equity in Twitch, but Aiden Ross has equity in Kick. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Charlie D'Amelio has equity in the step card. So I'm like, oh, okay. So either, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to set that trend for us, but I hope even with creators on other platforms like Twitch and Rumble that are black, start asking for equity ownership of these companies as well. So it's, it's one thing for Isaac to, you know, evangelize this, which I think is a worthy thing to do. How, how has the community responded you know how what, what impact does this have on engagement when people start to th- when, when their mind changes about you know ownership well i think the fact that we have investors already who have invested their equity owners in fan base so we have about fifteen thousand investors that have um you know um invested through fan base on start engine so that's awesome so then that's another level right and then there's other people there's celebrities that have invested in fan base that we keep quiet for uh, you know, very uh, very smart reasons. I think you know, I don't I don't like people to really know about that. I, I want people to I want all of us to be able to to benefit from this without um, the bias of how we may feel about one another um, in this space. Because sometimes I feel like wealth is a competitive thing in the black community, and I much rather a bunch of people have equity in something that they don't know who else has equity, and then when the time is done, everybody's rich and it's like, oh, I didn't know you was in on that too. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, but for the for the younger creators, it's been tough for me because I feel like there are some gatekeepers to those people. And sometimes those people are managers and managers know that cash is better than equity for them because they might not see a return on their percentage of equity. Mm-hmm. And that's even part of their deal. So if someone says, hey, you're going to get a $2 million deal or you're going to get a $2 million worth of stock, they're going to take the $2 million worth of, of, of money so they get that cash in their hand too. So. I think sometimes that also plays a role. So, um, but all I can do is educate. All I can do is is continue to do that. And and there are some different interested parties that understand the value of equity. Um, but again, I'm running into like, I'm running into those roadblocks of the gatekeepers that are like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, it's it's just something that I'm going to have to continue to do. But, um, but there are things in the works that that allow people, you know have uh, equity opportunity and fan base to continue to grow. Certainly, certainly. Before we talk about this $17 million round, I want to talk about what crowdfunding is. I want to make sure the audience is caught up on how this works. And so previous to a number of years ago during Obama's era, you, you and I couldn't get in on the social media app investment opportunity, which is where the money's made early. Can you talk about yep. that era and what it did for people like you and I? Yeah, so from 1933 to 2015, um, the only way that anybody could invest in an early stage um, company was being an accredited investor. And the accredited investor rule was basically a rule that says only rich people can have the best opportunity to invest in something. So you had to have a, a net worth of a million dollars minus your house or um, uh, make $200,000 a year for two consecutive years. And so think about that. That's coming out of the Great Depression. So even I don't care what color you were, there weren't accredited investors that were white in 1933. So it doesn't matter. So it's really just the rich trying to have the best opportunity to have access to companies. So Obama and Biden um, signed into law, the jobs act, which wiped out the accredited investor rule. So anybody can invest in a company 
um, that's looking to raise capital regardless of their net worth or annual income. So that opens up the door for all these equity crowdfunding sites to pop up, one of which is Start Engine, which I was able to use to raise capital. So I think, and especially in the black community when access to capital is so limited, especially in tech, I think in 2023, less than half of a percent of all VC dollars went to black founders, which is crazy. Um, and you know, banks aren't necessarily giving loans and there can be a lot of uh, a bias and, and, and racial uh, discrimination when it comes to that. So the opportunity for you and I to fund each other's businesses and have equity in them at the same time raise capital um, changes the game. And so that's why I've been such a big advocate of equity crowdfunding because um, as, as much as I have money that I've raised in fan base, I've also invested in other people's companies that I've introduced to Start Engine um, to do the same thing. And they're in all different sectors. There's, you know, a brewery, a, a, a bread company, um, uh, software companies, things like that. So another app. So I want to be able to make sure that I can invest in these startups the same way and then point people in the direction that they can actually raise capital because it's, it's kind of the information that's not known. Um, I actually had a chance to run into a, a, a woman that I met when um, I went to this event where, where Vice President Harris was the other day and she walked up to me and she goes, I'm about to raise $5 million on Start Engine. And the only reason I'm doing this because I saw what you did. Wow. And I talked to the CEO, Howard Marks, and I said, I'm, I'm here because Isaac Hayes came over here and raised money and I want to do it like that. And that's the reason why, because this is a whole opportunity for so many people that don't know how to raise capital for their businesses. Now, what I will say is it's not easy because you do have to have your business together. It's not like you can just go to start engine and be like, I'm gonna raise some money. <laughs> I think for me, even going through that process as a founder, it made me a better founder because I had to learn fan base from so many different directions, from the financial side to the legal side and stock structure and compliance and everything about my business. And so um, it made me a better founder and educated me in ways about my business that I would not have known if I would have just got VC dollars and trusted what these people were saying. So that's what I encourage everybody to do is to force yourself to learn more about your business through equity crowdfunding, investigate equity crowdfunding, learn about it, understand the Jobs Act and what you're able to do, and then take advantage of it. So most of the people who will be investing are not sophisticated investors. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I just mean you're just not educated and have a history of doing it. And so what yeah. what happens? So I give you, you know, well, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say I give you, I invest. $150, $200, $300 into fan base. What happens next? Well, let me let me dispel that. Let me let me combat that statement. Go ahead. When equity crowdfunding first came on the scene, VCs were very critical of it because they said, oh, you know, these investors are not savvy investors. They're not educated. You know, they don't know. They're not making the right decisions. And we don't want them to invest their hard-earned dollars into some sort of business that will never succeed. Mm -hmm. But it is no problem for any of those same individuals to go to Vegas and gamble $5,000 or buy $5,000 worth of lottery tickets to try to win the mega millions or Powerball. That's one aspect. Secondly, what's further disproving this is in the time that I've raised capital for fan base, there have been multiple startups that have been founded and funded by venture capitalists, given more money than fan base to start their business and failed in faster time. Yeah. So you don't know any more than the public does because you put $35 million into this startup and they went out of business in 18 months. I want to hear that from y'all. You put $11 million into this startup, the VCs, you vetted the company. You saw you saw the business plan, you saw the business model and you put 11 million, 35 million, 20 million and they failed. Yeah. And fan base is backed by a community of people that have put their hard earned money but not $250,000, $300,000 $400, $500 into the community, and they have equity on the cap table. So first of all, I don't like the fact that VCs are, are saying that because that was just a way for them to kind of make sure that they would, did not lose opportunities to be able to invest in a company like Fanbase and get a better deal. And, and, and sometimes even a predatory type situation is what some of these, these, um, these VCs come in and do when they invest in your company um, to do so. So for me, I just wanted to dispel that. When someone invest in fan base, you get equity. You sit on the cap table of a pre-IPO company. So this is no different if, if, as if you were investing into Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Uber, Lyft, like any of these mm -hmm. major you know, tech companies that you are. The difference, the only, the only difference is, is that you're allowed to sit on the cap table pre-IPO 
as opposed to typically retail investors are people that get access to buy stock after the company's gone public. That means way after everybody else has made all the real money, the real big, you know, multiples of of, of capital that have been raised, as opposed to at, like like Uber was Uber raised half a million dollars in their seed round, and one of the one of the investors who was already a multimillionaire put five grand and then turned it into twenty four million in nine years. So you see that right there. Those are the types of opportunities that happen where you can say, oh. I'm on the cap table of a unicorn before it goes public. Yeah, and so that's a pre-IPO um, equity position on a cap table of a company um, that you're able to do. So that's what it is, and I think that that's it's significantly important. And that's it's educational, it's prideful, it's powerful, um, and especially for for Black culture in the space of social media. Again, I talk, I stay in my lane. I'm talking about social media and tech. I think it's extremely phenomenal because. As a user, you have the ability to actually increase the value of an asset you own by simply using it. And even out, and even some investors in Fanbase have actually made the money that they've invested in Fanbase by using Fanbase to monetize their content. So you you can you can't even have anything bad to say about that. Like I put two hundred fifty dollars in Fanbase, but I made two hundred fifty dollars monetizing my content in Fanbase. And so um, that's that's the significance of of being able to sit on the cap table of a pre-IPO company. Yes, I like that statement you made and and your position on the sophisticated versus non-sophisticated. And I want to go a step further there and give you an opportunity to speak on this because there is, you know, there was a study, I I believe it was by Goldman Sachs, but I I can put it in the show notes. I'll find who did the study. But it was about how there are more black investors today than there ever have been. Young people are getting involved in investing. Um, But the while that's a good thing, the bad part was they were getting their education about what to invest in via social media. And it was just by what trending topics were. And they were being taken advantage of putting money in places that had no credibility and et cetera. And so I think I see both sides of that argument or that, that, that perspective on sophisticated versus versus unsophisticated. And I think that's a valid point. So to that point of education that you mentioned, how do I become more experienced to be able to make good decisions? Because when I'm investing in fan base now, I'm probably learning about crowdfunding via Isaac Hayes and his Instagram and his Twitter and his, his fan base account. So how do I become not just an investor in fan base, but a better investor to I'm doing this in three or four more of the opportunities that could exist. How do I become better in a better picker? I should say. So I can give this, from two sides, from the person that wants to raise capital and the person that wants to invest. I think the reason that fan base was able to raise capital, we raised 11 million in, in, in three rounds and, and now into our fourth is because there was actually a tangible product. So I say nothing speaks better than for fan base and itself than the ability for somebody to download the app, assess the quality mm-hmm. and then make that decision. I would have not been able to raise this money if fan base was a bunch of PDFs, <laughs> what I, what I want, what I thought I wanted to do. Yeah. So I think, I think when you're looking at a founder, you're investing in the product and the founder. So for me, myself, I put my own money into this. I built that I built an MVP product before I ever took money from anybody else. So I put my money where my mouth is, I delivered and people get a chance to see how committed I am to the process. And so I think when you're investing in any product, you can just look at a product and say, I think it might work and throw some money at it, like just like the lottery, or you can do what people say is due diligence. And especially when you're investing in um, equity crowdfunding, we have to file with the SEC, our financials are there, like, you know, all of the things that that we have to go through compliance are available um, in, in a form online for people to see. So we've had to be audited, you know, multiple times and all these things. And so, I think you have to do your same due diligence in investing in a startup the same way we have to do our due diligence for being able to be allowed to raise money. And so for any for any founder out there that wants to raise capital and equity crowdfunding, I tell them that yourself. Have a product already. Try to like get something that people can look at and touch and feel. I don't care if it's food, have it ready. If it's if it's if it's, if it's a beverage, if it's whatever it is, if it's something that people can use, the likelihood that they will invest in that product. It's higher because then you get to assess for yourself whether it's worth putting your money into or not. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on both sides of really securing that trust between the founder and the investor. And so I had my part to do. And I think the people saw that once I did my part, it, it was easy for them to do their part because they could go to the app store, download it, look at it. The app works. It does what Isaac says it's going to do. So I believe in what he's doing and I, and I, and, and follow, you know, 
my passion, and I always say this too about people, is sometimes like I'm a very committed founder and I'm very open about I've never taken a salary working for fan base. I'm not a person that I, I, I want people to understand how hard I work. I wear the same thing every day. So that's the <laughs> thing about it. It's like you're going to see me in a fan base T-shirt and some jeans somewhere. I'm either going to be here or somewhere at home working. I think also how you represent yourself as a founder, because I know sometimes it, it it's cool to be fabulous and a founder at the same time. But from a marketing spe- perspective, that doesn't look good to people that are investing. Because people are like, wait, is your money going to this vacation you on or this new car you just yeah. bought or, you yeah. know, these this, this excellent food you eat? And I'm like, no, nah, man, you got to you got to grind it out. Like, you know, you got to you got to drink this water and eat these cookies like I am right now. Like, that's what that's what you got to do. Yeah. So um, there's a lot that goes into your commitment and passion of being a founder. And that's how people trust you to invest in your in your in your business. Talk from the other side. So you, if you if you are um you said so many things there. So if I am learning how to invest and be a better picker, what what would you advise that person to strategically be doing? Because if I learned about crowdfunding via Isaac Hayes, I'm like, yo, I like what this man is talking about. I see where he's going. I got $400 to spend. Let me go put it on this. What should I be doing regularly? Should I, what, because what emails am I getting? Like, what am I doing to find out how my investment is doing so that I'm just being educated on this? So, well, I mean, so on a platform like Start Engine, you can actually go through the companies and look at everybody that's currently raising capital. So there's multiple platforms. There's Start Engine, WeFunder, Republic. So all of these have businesses that are that are trying to raise capital for what they're trying to do. And so um, in that process, the same, they all of these companies have to go through the same process that I did. Um, some of them are, um, raising money to build an MVP, and some of them are raising money to scale their business. So you might you might find a company that's raising two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to build their version of the product that they want. So it depends on where you want to get in, because that's a better position because there's a, that, that's a lower valuation. You you can help them actually build the you know the the prototype for something that may be you know phenomenal, and it's high risk, but it's high reward as well. Or you can say, okay, they already have a product, I can check it out. So I would say, you know, research the companies that are on um, these platforms like Star Engine. Take a look. Um, you can go through and read their decks. You can, you know, they have videos. They have a lot of things that they can explain about their company and their business. You see the team. Um, you see what everybody does. Um, you can actually research those people. So it's called it's called due diligence. And I think any like any corporation that's going to do business with you, even for us as a, as a tech startup, they're going to go through all of. They're going to go through my team. They're going to go through our financials. They're going to go through all of our contracts, they're gonna go mm-hmm. through everything. Like, how are you spending your money? You know, everything like that. So you have to do the same thing. So, but but I think getting on platforms like Start Engine is a way to kind of dip your toe in the water, you know, just to say, all right, cool. I'm gonna go look on Start Engine. And I say, oh, I see this nice company right here. Like, let me take a look. I kind of like it. I believe in what they're doing and let me see, you know, if I can help them out. So the, you, you mentioned the $11 million you've raised so far. So talk about the evolution of these raises and the significance of this $17 million. So the first three rounds, we raised about $10 million in three rounds. The problem that, that we were coming, coming into, we were running into is that I think fan base has gone past the point of being a startup and is now a scale up company. Mm. And when you're doing equity crowdfunding at the level that I was doing, it was called a reg CF level. And so at the reg CF level, you're only able to raise $5 million within a calendar year. And then you have to stop. So I would raise capital and have to wait until 365 days went by mm. to raise some more capital. And we had done well doing that. But we were like, man, like if we're gonna be able to catch, you know, some of these products out here or be able to scale or build the things that we want to do, we need to raise more than that. So there's another level of equity crowdfunding called a reg A. So when you go to a reg A, you can raise up to $75 million in a year. It's a lot more difficult. There's a lot more compliance, a lot more, you know, due diligence that goes into the process. But for us, we picked $17 million as a really good spot with a good three-year plan on how we're going to be able to do this. Um, And so um, by doing so, it gave us that opportunity to really figure out, all right, this is how we're going to raise this capital. We're going to be able to make the money that we're going to make. Um, We have a plan and we're going to be able to scale and build the business, you know what I'm saying, in real time without having to stop and start and stop and start. And so... um, this is a scale up opportunity because there's so many things that people want 
at a fan base and I myself, I don't like to not be able to deliver on what I want to give to the community. So this raise is, is definitely giving us, putting us in a position to not only catch the current apps that are out there, but surpass them because of my understanding of what I've learned of just observing how these startups work, which in my opinion, what happens with tech companies that are social media platforms is they have the, they have the, the privilege of being able to build a product, put it out in the marketplace, and then use the users as a focus group mm -hmm. to ideate and take their ideas and build something better, right? And typically those ideas come from young people and black people. Yeah. So I'm a person that was a social media user before I was a founder. So some of the ideas that I have are the things that I was able to put into fan base. And what gave me like a, a, a real boost of energy is when I saw the other platforms doing what I was doing and they have way more money than I do. Mm. So when I see everybody do subscriptions and build it the way that I wanted to build it, that gives me like, that makes me feel really good. It's like, oh, all you got, okay, you got the money. So the ideas are over on this side. So yeah. the only thing that I'm missing is the money. So let me raise $17 million as opposed to five at a time. And really, you know, I can I can expand our team. You know, I, we can go from 25 development team to a, a 65 person development team and really take these verticals and focus on them and scale. So for me, it gives me confidence. Every time somebody sends me something like, you know, Instagram just started doing this. So you know, um, TikTok started doing this. So you know, Clubhouse started doing this. And I'm like, these are all the ideas that I came with. So you just have the money. Yeah. So if money's the if money's the issue, then let me raise more capital and, and be able to, you know, ideate and build because there's things that we're doing that no other platform is doing, like content, like content migration. So the content migration tool that we built that you can migrate all of your Instagram content over to fan base, all your TikTok content over to fan base. No app has that. No, nobody even thought to do that. Nobody thought to make a giant repost app. Like and rather than post repost one picture with the caption, let me repost all the pictures, wow. all the videos with the captions and move them over to this platform. That's what we did at Fanbase. And so these are original ideas that we've even filed patents on because, again, I'm just trying to protect my own ideas because I know how often we come up with great stuff as, as black people and somebody else takes it and uses it and we don't get no credit for it. So, In, in the couple minutes I have you left, uh, there's no way I can let you out of here without talking about AI. And, you know, with as fast as this is going, you know, and you have, you've been very vocal about ownership, you know, especially you guys still have your father's, you know, legacy, you know, in the, in the family. And when you think about what's happening with voices and, you know, being able, like I saw your, your Jeezy post like that, and it sounds exactly like Jeezy. And I wonder like how, how, how do we mon how do we think about monetizing and protecting and monetizing our voices and our likeness in, in the days that are to come because they're honestly here? Yeah, well, I think from the musical perspective, I think it's gonna be a fight because I I, I didn't understand it first when it was photos. When when the photographers were saying all these AI images that are being created are getting trained off pre existing photos that people have already taken. And I didn't really think about that. But a lot of times those images and those photos are sometimes free, they're fair use. You know, they're just out there. So anything that you post on Instagram, anything that you post on social media, you know what I'm saying, that you share, those images can be taken or even sold from the corporation to train an AI model. So Facebook can say, here, take every photo we ever have on our platform and sell it to somebody to train an AI model. When it comes to music, it's copywritten material. You understand what I'm saying? It's like it's it. So there's a so there's a there's already ownership tied to the master and the publishing of those things. So now when you're training AI models on Jeezy, who is an artist that has has had recording contracts at, at at different labels, and he owns publishing, and then as a celebrity, he owns his name, image, and likeness. Now we're going into something entirely different. So I know the images are one thing, and 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 famous photographers' photos are getting trained off AI too. So there's that component, but with music there's really no way to really dive into the crux of being able to make something comparable and comparable to like, um, uh, comparable to like what a Jeezy or um, a Ron Isley or Whitney Houston would do unless you have Ron Isley, Jeezy and Whitney Houston. Yeah. And so we're gonna have to protect, you know, um, uh, copywritten IP. And then for every person, you, everybody, I think on the planet is just going to in some way, shape or form have to trademark their voice because these AI models are gonna get trained off of voices. Now monetizing it, there are, I've seen sites pop up now where voiceover artists 
are cloning their voices to be used for voiceover, which is amazing because now I can make money while I sleep. I done clone my voice and says, look, you can you can make you can make commercials about this, this, and this. You can't do politics, you can't do drugs, you can't do whatever, whatever. But if you want to make, you know, vo voiceover commercials about selling groceries or renting cars or whatever it is, you can do that and I make money while I sleep. I think that's gonna be a game changer um, for people, especially people with unique voices and also celebrities that just wanna make money. It's like, I don't even have to do that. They just use my voices the same way that they kind of did James Earl Jones with Star Wars. Like James Earl Jones sold his voice to Disney. So now they can make Darth Vader voices whenever they want to because they have James Earl Jones's voice. And so that's the kind of the kind of deals that I think are gonna happen, especially with, you know, famous celebrities, like people that have amazing voices like Morgan Freeman and, you know, Ving Rhames and stuff like that, that their their voices will be able to live on in perpetuity and be able to monetize and make money for their, them and their families um, down the road. So I think that's really great. Make your pitch for uh, this $17 million round for the people who are listening and they, they got a little bit of change and they're like, you know, how can I put this money to good use? You know, why should yeah. they be investing in fan base? Well, I think we're at a, we're at a, you know, an inflection point with um, social media being so uncertain. I know that subscriptions are the future. I see that what's happening with that. I think because of AI, IRL in real life content is going to be some of the most valuable content out there because I think you'll be able to render whatever photo you want, render whatever music you want. So platforms that allow people to monetize their real lives, the real content are valuable. And that's what fan base is, is built on. Um, when it comes to fan base in, in the black community, I'm the only black founded startup um, social media app that's currently in existence that was founded for the entire planet, but is black owned in infrastructure and ownership. And what I mean by that is um, sometimes I think we narrow our lane when we try to make something just strictly for the black community. And I don't want to limit us because I understand the reach of our culture. Our culture we go, goes beyond ourselves. So just making something for black culture to utilize black culture is fine, but making something for the entire world to have an opportunity to tap in and, and, and be a part of black culture, but actually have equity and sit on the cap table. So instead of being customers to our creations, we are turning our innovations into acquisitions. And therefore that is my pitch to tell people that look, Facebook and Instagram are not going to be and TikTok are not going to be the kings of the hill. There's no business that has existed that has lasted and dominated in perpetuity. Everything goes down. I, I remember looking at rewinding and saying, oh, what was the biggest, what was the biggest retailer 40 years ago it was Sears. And then at one point it was, it might've been Target and then it became Walmart and now it's Amazon. So these things change. And so with social media, there'll be new players to enter the game. And so fan base is your opportunity to own um, the next generation of social media platforms. And it's not expensive. It's $399 to invest. You can go to startengine.com slash fan base to invest. You get about 60 shares, 60 shares at 665 a share and you sit on the cap table of a social media platform that you have equity in as we continue to scale. We're already past 650,000 users, and uh, we're only going up from there. Once you start building community, it never stops. You just have to continue to keep scaling it. And so this is a business that will continue to grow. And I tell everybody, I don't want to be sitting here 10 years from now and be like, man, I should have got in on that fan base. It was just $400, yeah. but I went and spent it on you know, a steak dinner or something like that. I'm like, nah, hop on the cap table and then join us over, over fan base. Isaac Hayes. Oh, man. This was good. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man.